Blessings. Welcome, welcome, family. We will start. Before I make an introduction to this, uh, to this session, to this wonderful gathering of knowledge, I yield to our beautiful sister, Carol, to, to bless this session before we start. Mm, greetings, everyone. Thank greetings. you for joining us. I'm so grateful today for the opportunity to join with all of you in these days around the fall equinox when we take our time to notice the change of season, the change of light, the change of air, the change in ourselves, our plants, the birds traveling from one place to another so grateful to be able to share this beautiful time with all of you in recognition of the circle of life. And it is with that gratitude and love that we begin our presentation. Ashe. Ashe. Family, welcome, welcome from around the world, wherever you are, wherever you're tuning from. Grand rising, good morning, bonjour, bon après-midi, sabah al-khair, masa al-khair, salam alaikum in every language that I know how to say, maskofi. Let us know where you're tuning in from. I'm going to start with a very brief introduction about why this panel and how this panel came, this session came around. It is from conversations that I've had with these wonderful souls, these oases of knowledge, of wisdom, of and reminders of the many blessings that we have around us everywhere um, talking about all the medicine that we know of we heard of we don't know of we have no idea about because it just keeps coming it just keeps coming and we keep learning the more we interact with mother nature the name of the panel is compliments of carol's garden here and she'll tell you more about that. So I'd like to start, and I'm not, I'm not gonna get into introductions, I'm gonna have um, these wonderful souls introduce themselves. Each of them will take about five to 10 minutes to tell us their relationship with mother nature, their relationship with garden and what growing gratitude means um, and how that's, that's affected any healing, whether healing, healing themselves, healing others, bringing balance into this world. It's all connected, we're all connected and I'm so, so very grateful and I'm here ready with my pens and notes and I'm about to take notes and be prepared for your questions. Please, if you don't have a pen and a paper with you, get it, you're going to need it because there's some gems that are about to be dropped in this session. Carol, please start us off. Okay, great, thank you, Dima. Um so excited to talk about my work and about nature and gardening in general and its relationship to gratitude and joy um, for myself and healing. For myself, really, I guess there's never been a time that I can remember 
that I haven't been in some way connected with our soil. Um, my father was a gardener, my grandfather a gardener. Um, we used to hike. I always tell the story of dropping my mother and sister at church on Sunday mornings and us going hiking in the woods became my church, my place of peace, of calm. And I think over the years, um, it's just grown for me being with nature and um, enjoying my friends, the plants and the trees and the birds and the bugs. I remember in California, um, where I lived in Oakland, there was a friend who bought a house and had a pool and she filled that pool pool with soil and started a garden. And um, her whole thing um, was that the condition of her garden was directly reflective of her spirit's condition. And that really spoke to me, you know, it's like the energy that you put into cultivating the plants and working with the plants is, is the same as doing that for yourself. It's the same thing for me that when I'm working with the plants, they're working with me and I feel their energy. I give them water. They give me love. You know, I don't, I, I guess I could say that. I think, though, I, I mostly say to folks about getting with nature and getting with plants and growing gratitude is to start noticing the plants that are around you. Um, that's what my father taught me. We used to sit there and just notice what went on around us and try to figure out why and how things, all the beings interacted in the nature setting. My father, Wilmore Henry, I have to call his name. And so with my gardening now, I really um, think that the plants are my friends. You know, I go from seed to seed with them. And it's a cycle that we all share, but I'm not sure um, if we're all aware of this beautiful cycle of life that we're a part of. We're part of it whether we notice it or not. It affects us whether we notice it or not. And in noticing and becoming aware and kind of syncing with that rhythm, I myself am very grateful to have that it reminds me my garden is almost like a visual affirmation for me. I think the first thing I do when I get up is go to the window or open the front door and look at the garden or walk out into the garden and it tells me each day, okay, we're good or we need attention or we're thirsty or it's it's a sink. I sink with the spirit and energy of that place. And then also as a visual artist myself, um, as a painter and a sculptor, um, in the last 10, 15 years, my art has been the, my garden is the muse of my work. And nature in general is the muse of my work because when you become friends with nature and all of the beings in nature, they you feel their energy, at least I do. I feel the energy of thriving, of needing, of loving, all, all those things that I feel when I'm either walking in the woods or at the beach or in my garden. And that reflects in my artwork and my paintings and in my sculptures, uh, even my sculptures are made from things that I find in the woods. So I think cultivating gratitude is about noticing what's around you. Even when I lived in Oakland, it was the little patch of my front yard um, and all the indigenous plants that came to live there. Um, I think it's really a grounding and an elevating at the same time experience to make friends with plants 
share energy with them. It's healing, it's invigorating, and actually has become a big part of my life. So um, that's what I have to say to begin. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Beautiful. I, I'll, I'll also have you know that one of the things we do at Africa We Turn is certain quotes or certain things that are said that resonate with us. We put them here in little quotes that we'll be making into t-shirts eventually. So we have, we, we already have uh, a Carol Henry Alexander t-shirt <laughs> here. And we have about like 17 from yesterday's conversation. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Rabia, please tell us your journey. Well, my journey started out in Los Angeles, where I grew up. My grandmother, who lived eight blocks from me, um, had an awesome garden where she had lived in a Spanish style house with long, slender windows. And she'd open the windows up and look out at her garden. And she were, had a fish pond and she had a grape arbor and a a lime tree that grew over the fish pond and a huge avocado mm -hmm. tree and birds of paradise and begonias and this and that. And then she also had um, at our house, she, I guess, planted the garden there, uh, which we had same thing, rose bushes, birds of paradise, all these things. So I grew up, you know, with a bed of calla lilies and irises and all of those um wonderful plants that were just beautiful and inspiring and down the, you know, everybody in our neighborhood had fruit trees. So there were figs and apricots and peaches and everybody had limes and lemons and just, you know, you could eat your way up and down the street at any time, <laughs> which I did. And at the corner, this guy had a yard that grew, he grew uh, licorice. So on the way to school, I'd pull a handful of that out and eat it on the way to school. And it was just, you know, um, looking back at it, it was living in a um, place where there was such an abundance and everybody shared, you know, whatever they had in their yard. Well, mostly everybody and those that didn't, you know, we were kids, we just go get it anyway. <laughs> but there was just... Um, an appreciation and a love for nature and gardening. And, and I, as I mentioned the other day, you know, I was one that was constantly outside. I would climb out my bedroom window at night and go when the moon was full and sit in the driveway and just talk mm -hmm. to her. And, you know, it was just, um, for me, I was always fascinated with nature and, and had a really good, um, relationship with animals and birds and, and everything, most everything. Um, and even though I'm not a big spider person, but I just am fascinated by their webs. <laughs> they are so creative in their artwork and the way they create these awesome webs. I don't even know how they do that, but um, I don't know. I just think, and because my grandmother had this garden, I would sit and watch her in her garden. And my grandmother was Cheyenne and Blackfoot and Irish. And she had this hair that, you know, went all the way down to the floor. And she, I'd watch her brush her hair out, and wrap it in this bun. And then she'd go outside and she just quietly just kind of almost floated through her garden, looking at everything, talking to everything, touching everything. And I'm squatting out there in her garden um, when I was at her house and I talked to all the plants too, trying to copy what, try to get a little of that magic, you know, from her. And then as I grew, uh, my appreciation for plants and trees and things grew as I grew spiritually. They were teachers for me. Um, and I guess because I always considered them living beings and had a, a relationship with them. I never thought that I was odd until somebody told me I was, <laughs> but um, it was, it was an awesome thing. Mm -hmm. And then meeting Carol, she took me out one day and she said, you want to go and collect plant medicine? And I'm like, yeah, sure. So she took me around and we got mullen and she showed me where some, um, what is that stuff? Um, the red <laughs> clusters with all the little berries. Um, 
anyway, and so we picked all of this medicine and we put it in her car and then we were going back to her house and, you know, separating and doing all that. And everything was just awesome until all of a sudden there was this spider that came along with us. And I'm like, okay, done. Carol, <laughs> get that spider out of here. <laughs> and so coming forward now, she's inspired me as well as Fred Tutman, the riverkeeper at Patuxent. You have to have a garden. And I'm like, mm, I don't know about that. And so he came over and dug this whole thing, put a garden in for me. Carol came over all excited. Here's some squash plants I brought you that she put in. And I'm like, yeah, but are you going to come every day and take care of it? And she's no, no, this is this is your garden. Well, you know, <laughs> along with gardens come mosquitoes and all of that. So I came to the realization that Mother Nature is the best gardener on the planet. And there are her fairies and elves like you all that also have these awesome gardens and are great caretakers. But that's not my assignment. My assignment is to go for <laughs> forage and let her grow the things and I mind my business and she minds hers by taking care of my garden for me. <laughs> she waters it when it rains, she sends the sun, she does all of those awesome things and I trust her completely in that knowledge and I bless everybody who is able to go out there and do that but foraging has become my spiritual mission because we're in such a tough time to collect medicine plant and plants and learn and create medicine. And so um, I get that also, you know, from Carol in terms of foraging and just um, it stepped up another level when mother said, you know, go out and pick these plants because medicine is going to be needed. What's coming at you is, is going to be really tough. And the, you know, commercial chemicalized medicines aren't going to work, but I will provide you with the plants that you need. And so when people were having all this respiratory stuff, mullen was blooming like crazy. There was all this mullen plants and all these other respiratory plants and then red clover and all these things. And so, um, yeah, so being mindful of that, I'm so grateful um, to even be in this conversation and to honor my teacher. <laughs> and Wapajaya, who teaches me about making medicine and um, and all my other friends who are, you know, receiving pictures of things for me from me saying, what's this? And they're saying, don't eat that. <laughs> Wapajaya, I, uh? <laughs> I'm done. I could talk forever. So go ahead. Oh, me? Yes, you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, you know how um, the Asian ones say that um, <clears throat> that energy skips a generation. I grew up in Chicago, and of course, um, there was no place to plant anything there, and so my mother had an enormous amount of uh, house plants. She loved mm -hmm. them. She sang to them. She touched them. She played music for mm -hmm. them. And our entire house was just filled with beautiful plants because we lived in a housing project, so there was no place to plant anything outside. But in those days, when you had, I was the first generation that grew up in, in the North because my mother's from Mississippi. So... The uh, rule of thumb in those days was to send your girls down south. Um, they sent your know, boys sometime too, because Emmett Till was sent down south from Chicago for the summer to be with his grandparents. And my grandmother was a licensed masseuse in the state of Arkansas when I was a child. And she was also a hairdresser. And she made liniment and tinctures and she was always in her garden and she went to work every day with a black doctor bag to all of her patients um doing hair massage um, getting rid of um dandruff um eczema all kind of problems that people had she went with her black doctor bag and i had to go to work with her every day so from my grandmother i learned how to make medicine 
My grandmother also went to the supermarket every day. Because people are always laughing at me about how much I go to the supermarket <laughs> and how much food I buy. My grandmother went to the supermarket every day because my grandfather refused to eat second day food. And she didn't question him about it. She went to the store and said, well, Papa likes this and partner likes that. And oh, partner loves this, but partner don't like that. And so she was in love with taking care of people, partner included, her clients included, me included. And fast forward, when I started to study Ayurvedic medicine, they say that food loses energy when you store it overnight. So they encourage people not to eat second day food. Look at my little creek country <laughs> preacher grandfather not eating second day food. And he was healthy as a horse. He had a dry cleaner. So either I went with my grandmother to work with her clients or I went to the dry cleaners to work for my grandfather. And he was tall and straight and healthy. Um, he wouldn't drink soda because he didn't like that foot fizziness. He only drank water and lemonade. So my grandparents really, um, they made an impression on me about discipline, about using the earth to heal yourself, uh, also about working for yourself. Because both of my grandparents worked for themselves. And this is in the, you know, the 50s and 60s when I was going down there. So my grandmother is the one that impressed upon me that the earth has medicine and you can make medicine for any ailment you have because the earth has every single thing you need. And that's basically my relationship with the earth. You know, as I spoke about yesterday, Sequoia came and I had to always find out how to help him with different problems he would be having. You know, respiratory problems, um, swelling, um, insomnia, um, skin problems. All those things made me um, learn uh, what? Because my grandmother made soap too, but she used lard. And when Sequoia started having skin issues, I already knew how to make soap. I just needed to learn how to make it without lard. And so I began to, um, you know, study uh, vegetation soap making. So you know, I use macadamia oil and avocado oil, shea butter, mango butter to make soap for him because his skin is extremely dry for some reason. Uh, yeah, so that's my um, that's my relationships with plants is healing. I got a fig tree now. I've been wanting a fig tree for years because the first year that my mother and I uh, practiced Ramadan, we had a fig tree in our backyard. And I had been wanting a fig tree since then. And I finally went to a, um, Rabia asked me to come to a, um, a place in West Virginia with her to a convergence. What was it, Rabia? <laughs> Harmonic conversion? No, I don't know. I don't even remember. But anyway, it was a gathering that we were at in West Virginia and some and people were selling plants. And I finally got my fig tree. She did. She <laughs> yeah, was so excited. Over here. <laughs> I'll show you when we start to do our if we do a walk around. But I'm excited because I love figs. I love figs. And finally, I have a fig tree of my own. Name Figgy. <laughs> Name Figgy. <laughs> oh, my. Where did Carol go? I don't know. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. Because okay, when people call me, it makes your voice go down. Next time I'm going to cut the phone ringer mm -hmm. off so people can't call. Yeah, anyway, I meant yeah. to do that. Um, my, 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 oh, my, hey, Carol. Yeah, my side was <laughs> muted as well. I was trying to show here, we have Marissa who's tuned in, and she's saying she's also a wild crafter and a forager. And that she says to Apajaya's uh, comment, yes, you can't outsmart nature. 
You can, sure. and you were telling me about this earlier, uh, Wapaje, specifically about the thyroids when they were saying, when they were telling you, you know, they don't have, they don't have the medicine and, and nature quite literally healed your medicine, though it doesn't have much to do with gardening, but still. Um, it, you know, it does have something to do with gardening because for me, every aspect of nature is the garden. And I was telling her earlier that um, I had a thyroid problem that the uh, doctors were trying to convince me to take medicine, but they told me the medicine couldn't heal it. So if you can't heal it, why am I taking medicine from you? I may as well just exactly. do what I do. And I moved to Hawaii and I lived in a hut with no electrical current running through the wall. Just like I lived in a gazebo on the edge of a cliff where the ocean spray always came up. Because one of the things they tell you with the thyroid problem is that you should eat um, seaweed. You should have kelp and things like that. So I lived there. I was barefooted all the time. And I was just on the land next to the ocean. And my thyroid gland got normalized. So the environment that I was in made my thyroid gland become normal. When I came back to the East Coast, it started acting up again. So that means I need to live near the ocean so I can have constant seaweed ocean spray about. <laughs> clearly, clearly, clearly. Well, I'd like to pick up from there and, and ask your... Because in our conversations, we've exchanged different things that we know of certain gardens, certain, certain plants, certain, certain herbs that, that have medicinal energy to them that, that we can use as healing. And I know when I visited, um, well, not visited, when I, when I returned to my village, when I, and I can't say returned, it was my first time going to my village. I, I will find the right verb for this, this journey. Uh, <laughs> but when I went to my village and I was told about all, um, all the different things and the uses of certain things, my mind was so completely blown. I'll go and um, I meant to take it out earlier, but I'll go and I'll, I'll get those seeds in a bit. But if you can tell us um, your memory of, of something you've learned about a plant and its correlation to, a part, to healing something in particular, that you like, oh, I've, I've been seeing this or I've been crossing by this or, you know, this thing has been around me all my life and I didn't know that this is what it does or I didn't know that it's used for that. Take some notes, family and friends, if you're listening, because again, it is everywhere. This medicine is everywhere. We have Marissa here saying food is also medicine. So yes, the garden holds medicine. Our conventional doctors sometimes forget this. Right. I told Rabia a story about, uh, with me, when I'm going to need medicine in the future, it pops up around my house. And so one uh, summer, some mullins started growing by my back door. It had never grown there before. Um, I knew how to recognize it. And I was like, huh, okay, mullin. And so when harvest time came, I harvested all of it and put it in a glass jar that winter, Sequoia had the worst respiratory problem he's had in his life. And I had already had the mullet. And because the mullet grew, I went and got, I ordered some, some rose hips. Um, um, I had plenty of ginger. I had horseradish that I had already grated up and put in the fridge in a jar. So when he started, you know, having problems, I was able to put together um, lemons mm -hmm. and horseradish, um, honey, mullen, rose hips, and make medicine for him so that he got through that winter without having to go to the hospital. What what kind of medicine? What was it used for? For 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 breathing? Yeah, for respiratory problems. And what is it did you boil it? Did you have it to drink or well well um well with, with leaves you can't boil them. Roots you boil, but leaves you steep. So with the mullen leaves, what I did was boil the water um, with the horseradish and the ginger in it. I boiled those two things. And then when the water was boiled, I put in um, the mullen, the peppermint, and the uh, rose hips. And let that steep for about 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. Even sometimes you can let it steep overnight. It's called a decoction. It makes it stronger. And so, yeah, so, you know, because I drink tea all day long. 
according to how I feel, what I need. Um, so with, with, with that concoction, um, I was able to actually make cough syrup out of it for him. Amazing. Amazing. Carol, Carol, we can't hear you. Are you no. muted? No, she's not. You might need to it's leave and come back because something changed when, 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 you, when you left us and came back. I don't remember hearing your voice since you came back. No, try leaving, try, oh, yeah, there we go. Okay, well, in the meantime, Rabia, do you, do you remember your first, really, with plant and medicine? Mm. Wow. Or your yeah. most striking one, it doesn't have to be your first one, but one that really, for you, is just like, I guess for me, it was, um, I'm trying to think. Well, one of my favorites right now has been plantain. And Wapajea can tell you stories about teaching her children about that, because that also stuck with me. Um, and plantain is one that almost everybody has in their yard and walks on constantly like dandelion and just considers a weed and get it out of there because you know it's in the way but two of the most beneficial and healthy um, plants that we can use. And so I've used plantain a lot in terms of making, you know, tinctures and teas and gathering it. And, um, and it's good for, you know, wound care bites for cuts and stings and just all sorts of things. And so my, um, gathering of plantain. And I talked to Wapaje about this as well, because she uh, also has, you know, taught her, well, she can tell you, but I had, um, you know, an instance where, you know, every time I am foraging for medicine, no matter where in the world that I am, I have this relationship with, <laughs> with the medicine that um, as soon as I go to gather it and I'll offer water, I never take anything without gifting first and asking who wants to come with me, if anybody, and those particular plants will vibrate and I'll know which ones to pick some of and take. But I noticed that without even noticing it's happened, that when I go to lift my hand with the plant, my I'll be bleeding somewhere on my hand and I'm always gifting back some of my blood, which is an interesting spiritual connection to plants and maybe also a telling of what it's good for. So I've had, you know, children come that have gotten stung by a bee or a wasp or whatever and screaming and hollering, <laughs> be like, come here, I got just what you need and take them out and, you know, show them the plantain, have them pick it themselves, pick one, crush it up, you know, put it on there um, on the sting and and I'll add some tobacco and just, you know, to draw it out. But I have them put the plantain on there and then take a bigger leaf and wrap it as a Band-Aid, mm -hmm. which I do for myself. And within seconds, no more than a minute, they're amazed. They forgot they even got stung and they're off running around playing some more. And I say to them, you know, this is one of the greatest gifts um, that is out there for anybody, even the repairman that came here and got stung in the middle of his back by a wasp and came streaking up the steps, <laughs> um, you know, with so much pain. And I just got some plantain, crushed it up, put it on there. And within seconds, he just looked at me astounded and said, it doesn't hurt anymore. And I said, and this is what you have at home that you probably pick up, pull out of your lawn and, and it's disparaged. And I think, wow, you know, this is something that mother provided and it's everywhere for everybody to have free. And it's an awesome healer and medicine. And, and when you treat it respectfully, it will do all sorts of things for you. So I think that is one of the greatest um, gifts and benefits uh, uh, right now that I'll talk about is plantain as, as the top of my list of things. 
Yes, I. So, can you guys hear me now? Yes. yes. Perfect. So, before we go in so, with Carol so to, to tell us, uh, just a quick comment here from Joey Zaza. Joey, thank you for tuning in. Um, Joey says, gardening isn't just plants. Something like, I really hope I'm not butchering this word. Komogen? Komogen? Termite nest, boiled and drank, cures facial paralysis. Mm. Interesting. Flora, even the soil itself is 100% useful. And I do have a comment about the soil, but I did say I'm here to learn and absorb. So in the end, nope. maybe I'll, I'll sh share it now while it's on your mind. While it's on my mind. Well, because this comment come, came up again. So last week we had a question about women in Nubia, specifically pregnant women in Nubia. Um, for those who don't know, Nubia, well, ancient Nubia, was, is, is what is in modern day now, um, uh, Egypt and Sudan. It's called Upper Egypt, but on the map, I suppose, it's the lower part of Egypt, Southern Egypt um, and Northern Sudan um, is what was known as Nubia, and it's where the Nubian communities are predominantly today. And one of the questions from Nubia Fest last week was, why do pregnant Nubian women eat mud? You know, this, they, what, this I, th I think it was a researcher or something who had seen them eat mud. And the response to that was um, something to do with the calcium in, in the soil um, and something that, I guess, to help with, with holding the baby. And now again, we're seeing, it says um, the soil itself is 100% useful. And, Joey, if you can tell, like, maybe if you can type in the comments a little bit more about, you know, how you mean or elaborate on that. Komohen. Okay. I, I was going there, but I just wasn't sure. So it's pronounced komohen, pronunciation, thrown into a fire is an outdoors insect repellent. Just mm. for you, yeah, you might need some of those. <laughs> and you're Gotta asleep. find the nest first. <laughs> Yes. Okay, Carol, tell us your your um, your aha moment. Well, I had um, an experience when I was actually at um, Centro Ache here in Maryland with my first formal herbal medicinal plant um, studies, and the botanist who was there working with us had us go out into the yard, the farm, it was an herb farm where the classes were, and pick a plant and sit with it. And she told us to sit with it for half hour. So uh, being an artist, I took my sketch pad and I found this beautiful plant with yellow flowers and bees everywhere. And I decided to sit with it and, um, you know, just watch the bees, that early training of my dad, teaching you to be quiet, get grounded, and watch what's going on around you. And just notice every aspect of the plant from where, what it was like, where it came from, under the roots to the above aerial parts. And what shape the stem was, what colors. You know, I just sat there and drew and noticed. And it turned out that the plant was, is called St. John's wort. Mm. And it had beautiful yellow flowers, almost daisy-like and abundance. It almost seemed like a bush. And after, when she told us to come back in, it was almost like I had to pull myself away from the plant, like we had connected. And I had to pull myself away. It was really interesting. And was I was a little, you know, not totally of the human world. I feel like I had connected with other beings, you know? and the spirit of them. And let me tell you, I got such a buzz from that plant. It was a joy. It was a vibration. 
it was this energy that it gave to me, you know, it was like, that was towards the end of our weekend class. And I, I remember driving home, it was like I was above, my car was above the ground by a few feet. I was just <laughs> high from the beautiful energy that that plant gifted me. And it stayed with me for several hours. And I thought, oh, my goodness, it was just joyful time. And when I look up St. John's Wort, it is very much an antidepressant. It is a mood elevator, I find out now. And I started understanding that really connecting with the plants, sitting with them, touching them, um, you get an energy. You give an energy, but you also get an energy that can be healing for you. And it's really that energy that is my purpose of connecting with plants. I want to give my loving energy and I want to receive their energy. And it is a beautiful way, in my opinion, to really connect with what that particular plant is all about, what its attributes are, what it, why it's there on this earth with us. And for me, it, um, that kind of connection also helps me to understand why I am on this earth with them. It just seems like everything is a circle when you connect with beings other than, you know, just humans, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to say the joy of having friends who are plants and connecting with them and the energy that they, they project. It can be very healing um, and also f full of wisdom for us in our lives i would suggest anyone everyone to make an, a plant friend you know even if it's something that's growing in between the sidewalk where you live there's something about that seeing from beginning to end of life cycle that helps you understand your purpose so i've been looking for that experience ever since i never had that serious <laughs> joy buzz like i have with that saint john's word that was really awesome so i would encourage maybe the first time you ever do it is the best <laughs> <laughs> Dima, does anybody I'm, else really? Yeah, I'd like I'd like to share an aha moment of... with with nature. Yeah, um, I normally get bit all the time, but it doesn't bother me. And then one summer, I got bit by a wasp, and my whole arm swelled up. I had to call the rescue squad, and. They gave me Benadryl for the first time. I had already put tobacco and mud on it to take some of the swelling down. And I thought to myself, why am I swelling up when I normally don't swell up? So I was told by spirit to catch a wasp in a jar and shake the jar around to make the wasp sweat get in the jar. And then I opened the jar and let the wasp out, and I filled the jar with water and drank it. Oh. And I thought my, my, throat, my throat was going to close up. I was like, oh, God, oh, God. But I drank the whole jar, and then the next time I got bit, I didn't swell up at all. It didn't even turn red. That's like homeopathy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And my daughter was here. She says, Ma, stop it. You are crazy. Stop drinking wasp sweat. <laughs> and if anybody was going to do it, it would be you. <laughs> so I haven't oh, been boy. sensitive to, um, uh, to wasp bites since then. 
Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Huh? Yeah. Inoculation. Yeah. There you go. That is beautiful. Yeah, just like they can use snake venom to to heal um people that have been bitten by snakes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I guess that was a memory in my mind. Uh yeah, and it worked. That's amazing. We have Joey again here saying, I mean, I'm, I feel like the next step is we're going to drop the link and Joey's going to join us on this panel. Uh, <laughs> there we go. Joey, you, you know, you know, that's good. That's the next step. Just let me know if you're ready and I'll put the link out there. I'll send you the link. Okay. Joey says many of the Criollo and indigenous recipes of Borican, Puerto Rico have been lost. I know of only a handful compared to what I know was used. One of the unfortunate byproducts of Spanish mandate and American invasion of the island is a huge gap in the agricultural self-awareness and indigenous knowledge timeline. Yes. That's true. I agree. I think I really, that's why I appreciate when I'm able to be in Nigeria and Ghana with the elder women. You know, when I was there in uh, Ghana, I was in Nigeria in 2019 in the winter, and I got malaria. My first time ever, this mosquito bit me, and I started having fever. Well, you know, the mosquitoes are everywhere. And uh, people, what I learned is that the medicine to keep malaria from um, exacerbating and coming on with symptoms is their food. You know, like what they did for me was uh, mango leaf tea or mango leaf in the stew. It's like all the things that they taught me I needed to do to feel better for the malaria were things that are part of their everyday life. So as we say, food is medicine. It's like, adding these these things that are the ingredients that give the beautiful flavor to their indigenous foods are from the plants there. And the plants keep the malaria down. So, mm-hmm. you know... Yeah, it, I experienced the same thing with malaria in Nigeria. They, they gave me food and tree bark to get rid of it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. So probably our best medicine is all around us. It's not made somewhere else and brought here for us. Our medicine is all around us here. You know, I see it more and more. He says, evil people want to rule the world. The righteous ones want to be responsible for it. The farther we get from nature, the farther we are from ourselves. Right. Um, can, um, yes. Wapajaya, we have Joey asking uh, bark from what tree? Well, you know, it tastes like quinine. It was very bitter the way quinine is. Um, if he if he needs to know the know the answer to that, I can email my family in Nigeria and ask them exactly what the tree is called, but it tastes like quinine. It smells and tastes like quinine. Hmm. It was interesting. So I will there ask because them, they and then I'll tell you, and then you can uh, tell him yes. what it was. Yes. yes, please. I'll hold that information hostage until he comes through with his <laughs> panel for Africa Week. <laughs> he says, "Spell, please," and he says, "Yes, please." Find out the name and pass it on. Um, and Marissa here is saying, "Zaza, get in on it." I extend <laughs> the invitation once again. We have about. Uh, 10 more minutes before we need to start wrapping this up to prepare for our next panel. So this is your chance, Zaza. This is here. This is a full full circle, full pool of, of knowledge and wisdom only, exclusive well, at Africa Week 2020. <laughs> Carol? Well, I would like to also um, share uh, the experience that you know when you are close with nature or the living beings all around you um it's hard to romanticize nature i don't want us to romanticize nature because in this moment the struggle that we humans are having that that mother nature is also struggling I see it in my garden. I see it like because 
these last few years, I've had 10 times more groundhogs and raccoons and deer coming to eat my garden and they're aggressive. It's like you can tell that the environment and nature is out of balance. The, I've seen actual fights between bees. You know what I mean? I mean, come on, y'all brothers. You know what I'm saying? But it, it's the resources are being misused in our planet. And it's what keeps me involved in environmental activism and mostly environmental justice because it is our communities that have all of these facilities that degrade our natural environment and cause this kind of out of balance sense. So I encourage the nature lovers to fight for nature, fight with her for her to become balanced once again so that because her balance is our balance. Now we have to all work together around that. Not just take, but give also. Give. Give mightily. Yes. And with love. We do have a question here about what one can take uh, to shorten uh, shorten the period. She wants three less days from, <laughs> from Alexandra. Um, we do have a response from Marissa saying, if I might answer, switch to a menstrual cup and ensure you have good, healthy, saturated fats for hormone health. Drink cucumber water during the period to keep your body hydrated with silica minerals as well. This should shorten the menses as much as possible and make things flow a lot better. If any of you have... Um, any other uh, suggestions or information? Yeah, you know, phys physical activity is um, is helpful too because women who are athletes, they actually lose their period. And so she could try, um, you know, physical activity. Uh, the other thing uh, that helps to keep your body regulated is um, steaming your womb. Like after her, your blood is gone. Uh, make a make a ritual of, of steaming your womb because then uh, things start to work um, more congenially with your body. And the other thing is singing to your womb. If you want your body to do something, sing to your body, sing to your womb. Put your face down where your womb is and sing to it and express your desires to your body. And our body is so intelligent. It's made to self-heal. And... You can get what you want from your body by talking to it, singing to it, hugging it, um, throwing kisses mm -hmm. at it. You mm -hmm. know, your body responds to that type of love. Mm -hmm. Yes, and another thing is, um, you know, things that are red, things that, you know, nature provides us with um, color codes mm -hmm. a lot for the things that we um, can use things for. And so things that a lot of times that are healthy for blood um, are red in color in our food. Um, there's, well, Pajay, I remember you told um, uh, my family line of women always who had very um, painful menstrual cycles, um, cramp bark. Also, um, oh, what did I just pick the other day? And my friend from Colombia was saying they, she called it by a Spanish name and she said they drink that for um, menstrual cycle. And it is, geez, Carol, you and I went and you showed it to me. We didn't forage it because it wasn't ready, but you said a friend in California or somewhere gave you a bunch of it. It's also used as a spice. Um, it's red berries. Oh, are you type talking red berries? Yeah, are little tight about... clusters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, also too, you know, raspberry leaves are very good for women's um yes. women's uterine health. And if you yeah. look at the raspberry, it looks like the it looks like the tip of your breast. Mm -hmm. It's exactly identical to the nipple of our breast. So motherwort is a, is important for us to drink. Raspberry leaf is important for us to drink. 
um, black cohosh is important for us to drink. You know, so if she wants to encourage her body um, to have a shorter, um, you know, time of, of, of blood, um, yeah, she could begin to drink those herbs. Although, you know, when I was raising my daughters, I didn't let them go to school when they were bleeding because when you are bleeding, that is time for you to rest and relax yourself and read books and look at movies. And I had my daughters write a menu of what they wanted to eat and somebody in the house had to cook it and bring it to the bedroom. So I always made them rest for three days um, so they could, you know, be in a natural cycle of their body. So running around up and down, you know, I, like I said, I don't know why she wants less blood, um, but whatever the reason is, you can connect with your body and, and have her to assist you. Yes, and also cinnamon. I want to mention oh, cinnamon's yeah. really good. Yeah. And also, you know, not throwing and wasting your blood and throwing it away. Develop yes. that spiritual connection to your blood. And if you use those cups, take your blood out and put it in your garden or in your plants and help to nourish the plants um, with your blood. And also that helps you spiritually connect to the plants and to the earth. Um, mm. we take mother's mm. blood all the time. We can give, that's a blessing that women have and stop calling it the curse. All those who have been trained to say, oh my God, I'm getting the curse and all of that. That's such a, um, insulting and disrespectful thing because yeah, your womb it is hears such, that. your womb hears that and you cramp even more. It's like, oh yeah, well, I got something for you. How about this? But <laughs> it is, it is such a, women have to really be conscious about the way we speak. Stop saying we're sorry about everything. We're not. Um, we've been trained to be, to be more attentive to what your body's saying. There is a, that's why, you know, we say mind, body, spirit, but there is that connection of spirit through everything. And for women, like Wapaje was saying, when you're on your cycle, you are, you know, you are doing something magical. And we are alchemists as women, too. And if you use that time that you're bleeding to do your dreaming and your painting and your beadwork and your um, poetry, or if you just go into sleep and let your body rest, there's a reason that we have that. And if we don't fight it and call it all sorts of out of its name and, and disparage it, um, the attitude that you have when you're bleeding also affects the way that it affects you. But if you embrace it and you honor it as something that is an awesome experience and gift that you have to be able to nurture life and your body and the planet, um, that whole attitude and that spiritual connection and vibration that starts to form within you will take care of whatever it is that you know, you're know you having issues with. It's all of how we look at things and have been trained to look at things um, that are not you know, of the highest vibration. Also, don't use sanitary napkins from the supermarket and from the drugstore. They have formaldehyde and bleach in them. So you want to have a, you want to go to the fabric store and buy yourself some cotton, some, you know, white cotton, and put that um, in your panties because you want to have physical contact with your blood. You want to bleed into a cloth and then take that cloth and wash that cloth out and get to know your blood mm -hmm. and thank your blood. And then as, 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 as Mama Rabia says, and then pour that into the earth, right? This is a ceremony for you and your body will begin to come in sync with itself once you become in sync with it. So have contact with your blood and appreciate your blood and sing to your blood and allow your blood to do its job. Thank you. Uh, Alexandra says, thank you, valuable. She'll check in next month. Joey Zaza says, in Puerto Rico, palateria is used. It's a succulent plant that usually grows in pots of other house plants. And then Alexandra says, wackadoodle dreams on my cycle every month. <laughs> <laughs> I, I use a cup and reusable pads. Okay. 
Good. So when you start to do create your own ceremony with your blood, your wackadoodle dreams will start to um, even out into dreams that will help to guide you and they won't be so wacky. Oh, she's you know? emphasizing the wackiness. She says whack. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, even in wacky, some of the most awesome things get triggered, but really come into relationship with your blood. Stop struggling against it because even later, if you haven't had children yet, I don't know how old you are, but you know, this is the precursor to when you become pregnant and when you have another form of blood and what's being created with that blood in your body and going through the whole thing of childbirth, which is a whole nother story. But um, it is like you're priming your body. How, however you think about things, your body is listening and it, you're training it to, to respond a certain way. So if you're responding negatively to things, your body will do the same thing because it's like, oh my God, what is she saying? Okay, so it's expect you expecting trouble and cramping. And if you're expecting a terrible experience, then your brain says, mm -hmm. okay, I can provide that for you. Is that what you're telling me to do? So really, you know, go inside and really start asking your own spirit, start talking to your body and loving and saying, oh, awesome. Okay, this is something exciting that's coming. This is something I honor and respect that's coming and treasure this and your body will respond accordingly. Yep. So gratitude, Arubia, that's what you're talking about, having gratitude for the functions that are natural to our being. Yes, absolutely. You know, and there are many, many women that would love to bleed that cannot, you know, so we shouldn't take anything for granted. We should be in constant gratitude for all the gifts that we get. Well, it's growing gratitude and growing through gratitude, right? Absolutely. Yes, very much so. Yeah. So I wanted, to share, I wanted to share this plan. This was my moment with, with plants and... So I had told you about about this garad um, when we're speaking. This is what it looks like. Rabia, you you seen this? We've used this as as incense. Mm -hmm. um, so this, I don't know the name for it in English. I think we looked it up, and it had something to do with um, press. I think. However, garden press. I, I, no, I think that was Habu Rashad, though. I don't think yeah, that was, was Habu Rashad. That wasn't Garad. That Garad was something else. Yeah, I, I, do, I don't I remember. Don't remember what it was, but mm. here, this is used the, in, in my village. This is used as incense, as a form of uh, antibacterial and clearing of the air. Um, so when, when everything COVID started, all the Sudanese mothers. Um, pulled out the gutter because it's used very widely in Sudan. It's not just in the way. All of them just like pulled that out and just started burning it around the house just to clear the air, to purify if anything was that in there. That. That, this. Beautiful. Um, another thing that's done because you were talking about malaria earlier. Um, so with the fever that comes with malaria, what they do is they, they soak these in water and then in the morning, they wash the person's head with the water that had these soaked in them. The gut had soaked in it, and that fever is gone. I had that when I came mm. here. When I, when I came, when I came back, it was in April. My fever had had reached. I think it was 107 or something ridiculous. My sister was convinced I was going to die, wow. so I told her to 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 soak some of that in in the water and whatever little functionality I had. She did, and. Um, I washed my head with it the next morning and I was fine. It went down to 97. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's really power. It's used for other stuff. Like if you chew on it for your teeth, it's really good. Um, if you chew on more than one, it's, it's good for the digestive system to clear. We really have, I mean, we're surrounded by blessings and it, it all goes back to giving gratitude. And there's, there's an ayah in the Quran. Um, it said, if you give gratitude, I give you more. If you give thanks, I give you more. So the more you thank, the more you give gratitude, the more you receive, the more the more you take. Mm -hmm. 
I, I will give. Um, yep. No, I, but, you know, God. So <laughs> it is a challenge to have gratitude for a 10-day lessons. <laughs> Give okay. <laughs> I get that. I get that. Yeah, I get that too. But you know, you can if when it's all about programming your body as well. And so um try that. Try, you know, doing the resting and doing the blood building and doing the um, you know, using the cups and, and pouring your blood on the earth and talk to your body and talk to your blood. And say, you know, this is a lot of this. I'm grateful for you, but this is a bit of a challenge. Ten days is too long. Can let's get it cut down to maybe three days? Because you know, in ancient times in Africa, women never bled, from what I understand, more than two to three days. These long periods that we have nowadays are because of chemicalized things that we're doing and sanitary napkins and all this stress and all these other things, but it was abnormal to bleed more than that time. So, um, and alcohol too. If you're drinking alcohol and all that around that time, lay off that kind of stuff, you know, look at your diet because a lot of times that affects what is going on and why you're bleeding so long. And find a good, you know, herbalist or homeopath or acupuncturist or something and, and, you know, go and talk to them as well, because there's a lot of knowledge and traditional things. And um, my friend Estella, I was trying to get her on today. And it's interesting. She said to me earlier, because um, we were talking about spirit and, and I use a lot of the products that she made, uh, Growing Blue Flowers. And she was saying that, you know, she learned a lot of things from her life walk through different communities and different places and through um, native culture and things. And she said, but it all led her back to Chinese culture. Um, it led her home to where she needed to be. And she started to see some of the same things within her own culture. And she said, and I never lost sight of that I'm Chinese and that I have a heritage and a cultural um, link. And I think as people from the African diaspora that we also, no matter what else we're mixed with, in our walk, when we ask, we are shown um, the things from our ancestors um, that we can find here or, you know, there, but it leads us back home. And like you said, Carol, it's all about gratitude because every time we say thank you, um, every time we show true gratitude and excitement over growing a garden, doing a walk, you know, being in nature, just looking at the sky and thankful for the rain instead of cursing it um, and the sun, that we are in that gratitude space, um, more things ignite for us. And right now, goldenrod is just like everywhere and the cycles are off, but things are coming and going quickly, quickly, but in tremendous abundance. And Carol was saying she was picking goldenrod. Estella was saying goldenrods everywhere and black eyed Susan, which are two awesome herbs, um, great medicines, goldenrod for one thing, sinus and stuff and the roots of the black eyed Susan. Um, but I see Wapage is out there at her tower. So we let's get let her get that in real quick. So I'm sure that's why she went out there. Wapage. Okay, good. Wapage. Woohoo. Then I don't think she can hear us. And unfortunately, I'm we're gonna have to, to wrap it up because the next panel starts in six minutes. Okay. But well, what you saw in the background was this white tower that she grows. Her oh, hydroponics I'm to wait. I'm, we have to start in six minutes, but I'll wait and learn. <laughs> no, no, no. She is hydroponics, what she's using. So, can you hear us now? Yeah, I hear you. Um, okay, yeah, here's, here's, have... here's, my daughter bought me this hydroponic system to grow food because my land wasn't really growing too, too well for some reason. She bought this for me, and it's water in here. You put nutrients in, and then all of these these plants they just let their roots go down into the water, and then they suck from that. We can't hear. 
We saw it, but we couldn't hear what you were saying. Oh, okay. So I was saying that um, when I got home, my land wasn't growing good enough. My daughter bought this hydroponic growing system. And you put the plants inside these little holes right here. And the fruit go down inside the plants. Water and What's I got song? cilantro and Thai basil and sweet basil and bok choy and parsley and string beans and thyme and Swiss chard and marigolds mm. <laughs> and chives. Beautiful. Yeah, I have all of that here. I'm going to stand back. Can you see it? Oh, I thought Wapa J was going to sing. I got really excited From too. Well, we got how many minutes? Four. Four. Wapajea? Yeah. A two minute song. Okay. So, did you hear what I just said or no? Yes, yeah, about all your plants and your hydro um, gardening. Yes, we did. Marigold. Yeah, okay. Sing us out. We got two oh, minutes. Sing us. Oh, okay. Sing us out. All yeah. right. <laughs> I didn't yes, hear you. Friend, thank you. Before Wapajaya starts, thank you to all of those who tuned in, who asked the questions. We hope you gained as much as much as I have because, you know, the notes yes. are right here. Um, thank you so much. If you have more it's questions, totally reach out. And please, please, please enjoy the next two minutes because they will give you life the way they have given me life for the past <laughs> Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Wapajaya, please close us out. Mm. All right. We lost her. Okay, can we hear each other? Right, Dima, you good? Yeah. Beautiful. Okay, how do I sound? Perfect. Right, I'm just trying to make sure. I wonder why we keep losing her. Thank you, everybody. Blessings. I'm leaving. Thank you, Wapajaya. Love you all.